Hello, Gary Stearman with you once again from North Jerusalem. We are in a hotel meeting room and the we being Pastor Tom Hughes and myself. Pastor Hughes, of course, has been on Prophecy Watchers before. He pastors a wonderful church out in San Jacinto, California. It's called the 412 Church. Tom, it's good to see you again. We just sort of ran into each other here. Yeah, it's great being here. I just happen to be here at the same time as you. And it's great to see you, Gary. It's great to see your, your friends that are with you also. Oh, we've got a lot of friends. But... Let's talk for a minute about the experience of Israel. I think we chatted before we, we turned on this camera, and, and Tom and I agree that, that, that the excitement that is the, uh, what can you say, the, the proximity of all the biblical yeah. locations really stirs your spiritual imagination, doesn't it? It really does. You come to a place like this, actually the only place in the world like this, and yeah. you realize the Word of God, everything you've been reading, which you have in your head, and suddenly you're, you're walking in those places, whether it be a city or a place like the Sea of Galilee or whatever it may be, suddenly it becomes very real, and you realize, wow, this is in the Bible. This really is a real place. It's it not really like is. you're just reading a book in a faraway land, and you realize Jerusalem really is God's city, God's stamp is all over the city of Jerusalem and all over the nation of Israel. Indeed, and uh, Tom and I uh, reminisced a bit about uh, the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum uh, before we uh, came on today, and we both had some amazing experiences there. Both went out on a boat, we both visited Capernaum and had our own impressions about it. Uh, what did that do to you being there? Well, it's, it, yeah, I've been here several times, and each time it's, it, it's, it's a deeper experience in connecting with the Word and what the Lord has done in my heart. When, when we go to Capernaum, for example, you look at the synagogue, and yes. you realize, okay, that's the location of the synagogue, even though there's been some rebuilding in centuries past. The location, the exact synagogue, that place where Jesus taught when he was here on this earth when he lived in Capernaum. Right. And as a teacher, he would have taught at that synagogue on Saturdays. And you realize that's right there. And you go and you walk into that synagogue and it is, it's just an amazing thing. Then you go on to the Sea of Galilee. And I think I told you a few minutes before we came on that I was on the Sea of Galilee the very first time I came and there was a storm that came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we... Christians who were on the boat, we were kind of naive, and we thought this was just a normal thing that happens on the Sea of Galilee with every group. Right. And the storm was coming, and, and, and we were getting wet, and the boat's going up, and, and uh, we found out later the crew was, was frightened. They were actually concerned that they were going to lose the boat. And we were laughing the whole time because we know the biblical stories of the storms on the Sea of Galilee, and, and Jesus says, O ye of little faith. And also, uh, uh, all around that entire sea, which has, by the way, uh, three names, depending on how it's referred to in the Bible, we, we yeah. need to talk about that later. But what I really wanted to bring up was the fact that there's this marvelous uh, episode in the Bible, right at the close of the Gospel of John, yeah. where... Uh, Jesus appears to the disciples who are fishing. And of course, how many sermons has that appeared uh -huh. in? Uh, a lot of sermons. And I love it at the end of the Gospel of John, and it's a passage I love. And uh, there's various different possibilities of uh, some of the things that come out of that. That's John chapter 21. Jesus has already died and resurrected, and he's now in the area of Galilee. The disciples are discouraged because the one that they were following has died. They didn't understand that he rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. But there they were. They're saying, Peter says, I'm just going to go back to fishing again at the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. The other disciples say, well, we're going to join you. We might as well just go back to our life the way it was before Christ. So they get in the boat, they go out fishing all night, they don't catch anything, and there's Jesus on the shore, they don't recognize him, and they, they don't catch anything, and, and the disciples come in, or they're getting ready to come into the shore, and Jesus tells them to throw the net on the other side of the boat. 
And they do. They're obedient to him. They don't, mm -hmm. as far as we know, they don't sit there and argue and say, you don't know what you're talking about. You, we're fishermen or anything like that. But they throw the net on the other side of the boat. And the Bible tells us that when they pulled the fish in, there were 153 fish. And I look at that, Gary, from various aspects. One of them is that if the disciples weren't obedient... If they weren't obedient and throwing the net to the other side, I look at this. The boat, I think, is about 90 inches wide. Uh, you you saw the, the Jesus boat that, that's sure. there in Galilee, about 90 inches wide. Uh, the difference between zero and 153 was 90 inches. Between no miracle at all, it was simply mm. yeah. 90 inches. That's all it was. And you look at that, all they had to do was go from this side to this side. That's probably a little bit wider than this table. And... And that was it. And that's all Jesus asked them to do. And I think that sometimes with us, we want God to do these great big things. And God says, you be obedient to me in the small thing, and I can do great things. And it's a lesson of obedience. Following the leading of the Lord. Following, just, just being obedient with that leading of the Lord. And you've seen other things in that same passage, too. Well, after he told them to cast uh, the net on the right side of the boat, now it, that's in, uh, I'm, just, I'm looking at my Bible here in John 21. Uh, six, he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. Well, uh, as you've just described. And so they did what he said in, in, in the very, very famous story. Uh, in verse 11 of this same chapter says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And I have a take on that that the, the Lord showed me, I believe, uh, some time back. The people have asked, why 153? And I was doing a Bible study on Zion, and I discovered that Z the word Zion appears 153 times in the Bible. That's N New Testament and Old, by the way. That is fascinating to me. Well, Very fascinating. It means something. And I'm sure we don't know all that it means, but what it means is that <clears throat> the word Zion encompasses the symbolic idea of the completion of God's work on, on earth. And since the number of fish is 153 and the, and the number of Zion is 153, that there's got to be a connection mm -hmm. there of some sort. And I, one of my favorite passages in Scripture is in, in Psalm 87 where it says, His foundation... Uh, it's Psalm 87, his foundation is in the holy mountains. And then it says, uh, and this is I ju just love, uh, the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. And that says a lot. That, that I, I love that. But this is, this is kind of, I, I just find it fascinating for me. I was, uh, haven't been able to talk to my wife much since I've been here because she's been back home with our kids. Yeah. But I've been texting her, and I said, and she texted me a, a picture of the sunset from our home. And she says, it's beautiful here, but not as beautiful as Jerusalem. And I texted her back. I said, there's nothing as beautiful as this place, God's land, Zion. There's, it, it is, it's God's city, and there's no place in the world that will ever match the place that God calls his own regardless of physical beauty. We stood with our guide this very morning on, on uh, uh, a, a space of ground between Mount Scopus and, and Mount of Olives, uh, looking off to the mm. east. And our guide pointed out that uh, he believed that someday that mountain is going to split and water is going to come out of the top of the mountain, flow down to what is now the Dead Sea, flow out to the Mediterranean. And he pointed out that there, there are natural rifts in, in the rock uh, that would be split open uh, in a very natural pattern that people already know about. And here we stood right at that spot, which will one day be huh. split. And it, it, that is a staggering thought when you're standing there. It is. You, what else, you know what else is interesting? We didn't meet until tonight here, right? Right. We had that same conversation this morning really? with our group, and I'm standing there at the Mount of Olives and talking about it, how the exact same thing, that this is crazy, and the people that were with us were looking over my head towards the, the, um, uh, the wall, 
the yeah. Temple Mount. And I say, imagine Yeshua is going to come back and reign from here. Mount of Olives is going to be split, moving to the north and moving to the south. The river is going to flow from here to the Dead Sea, and there's going to be fish. They're going to be live in the Dead Sea. And I said, I said that's going to happen in the Millennial Kingdom. And for me, that's pretty exciting when, I, when you start putting these things together and having our feet stand in the place mm -hmm. where the feet of the Messiah will stand and where they stood in, in times past when he walked this earth as a man. Mm -hmm. Pastor Tom Hughes of 412 Church, San Jacinto, California, we just met. Uh, by the grace of God, and it's great to have you with us right here on Prophecy Watchers. Tom, Lord bless your work, and we'll see you soon. Great. Thank you, Gary. All right. And keep watching, everybody. We are.